you for the conies, Mr. Barker. The servants do like to eat rabbit. Well, if they're anything like my sons, they'll be glad of them now, but by March they'll be complaining they've never had anything but. That may be very well, but I think Marianne and I can come up with plenty of recipes so they don't get bored before then. Now, what I really wanted to talk to you about was Halloween. Andrew, is that his name, the steward's room boy? Oh, Andrew Scott, yes. Yeah, well, he's asked me to tell some ghost stories in the servants' hall. And I wondered if you might be able to give me a hand. It's nothing much, just a few lines. Oh, for Halloween? Well, November the 1st is All Saints Day, and I was always taught to honour the dead as well as the saints. Well, I've been reading up about the origins of Halloween, how when we were all pagans, spirits used to wander abroad and people lit fires to ward them off. We used to have an Irish pot washer, and he used to say his family held to old traditions, old as well, he didn't know when. And they used to have a big family meal, and they put out a portion of food for the spirits, and they always lit a fire. I wonder if they do something similar in Scotland. Don't you remember the Queen? She had a bonfire at Balmoral, and they burnt an effigy of a witch. Well, there's those lanterns as well. They make out of uh, hollowed out turnips, uh, punkies. Oh, that's what they call them in Somerset. In Norfolk, where I used to work, they call them jack-o'-lanterns. But that was also a name given to marsh gas. I think there was some a story, a nonsense really, about a, a fellow called Jack. No doubt a tall tale made up by somebody in a pub to entertain a learned scholar collecting folk tales. <laughs> well, in America they use pumpkins, don't they? Oh, that reminds me. Mr. Vert said it's been a good year for pumpkins oh, and vegetable marrow. I do find it difficult to find recipes for them. They're so um, watery. Didn't you make a pie out of them with apples? Oh, that was with pumpkins, yes. My pumpoin pie. It's a rather good recipe. Now, Mary Ann was telling me where she comes from in North Yorkshire. Their children would go out looking for soul cakes. They travelled the village looking for cakes, soul cakes. Although she did say that last time she went to visit her parents at uh, this time of year, uh, they don't do it as much as they used to on account of the children having to stay at school for longer. Well, I would welcome a cake or two if they were made under your watchful eye. <laughs> I'll see what I can do, Mr Barker. Well, shall we have a look at this? Um, wh who am I to be? Oh, I thought you could play a cook called Margaret. Margaret? So I can just be myself? Well, if it suits, shall we have a go? <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> right. Now, all this happened when we were preparing for one of his lordship's shoots on another estate. Up north it was. Pleasant, heathery countryside and decent shooting. Now, I was staying in a spare room in the servants' quarters, and their cook, Margaret, took me under her wing and made sure I was well fed. Now, we arrived while yet the daylight lingered, and whilst their lordships were at dinner, I went for a, a ramble about the estate. Now the house and the gardens faced to the south, and they looked over a few acres of pasture land down to a little winding stream that was beside a little thatched cottage that had its own vegetable patch, and it was clearly on the grounds of the estate, so perhaps a gardener's cottage. But as I got closer, I could see that no smoke curled from the chimney and it had an air of waiting about it, as if it had been deserted for years. The gardens, too, were untended and unweeded, and there was a row of chrysanthemums all shriveled up on their stems. Now, the winter sunshine faded fast in the twilight, and the whitewashed walls gleamed in the gloaming, and I thought I caught out the tail of my eye a light on inside one of the windows. So was it empty and untenanted? As I turned back, I realised it had been a trick of the light, perhaps a pane of glass reflecting the sunset, because it looked desolate and deserted. Now, as I looked at it, I couldn't help shape the feeling, something uncanny, that there was actually someone there. So I went through the garden and I knocked at the door, but no one answered. Of course, no one answered. I chided myself that I'd been like a, a man who looks under his bed for a burglar and would have been beyond measures surprised if he'd actually found one. Well, I returned to the house 
and I had my dinner with Margaret, made by her fair hand. And afterwards, she got out her favourite pastime that she picked up off the mistress of the house. It's called a planchette, and it speaks to the dead. Does it work? Well, it says things that are never entered my head. You let the pencil write what it chooses. Very often, it only makes a swirls and curls, and every now and then, a word appears. Yesterday evening, for example, it wrote gardener over and over again. Now, now what could that mean? The gardener here is a Methodist with a chin beard. Could it have meant him? Well, that little cottage down by the footbridge, is that the gardener's house? Oh, he used to be, but the chin beard fellow doesn't live there. In fact, nobody lives there. It's empty. Why do you ask? Just curiosity. Idle curiosity. I don't believe it was. Well, I saw it and I thought that it was empty and then I had a strange feeling that there was somebody there. So I knocked and I walked around the house. Uh, and there was no one. It's odd. I had just the same feeling as you. There's your answer of why your planchette saying gardener again and again. You're thinking of the gardener's cottage. How ingenious. A mystery solved. Well, I went upstairs to bed and as I went to my room, strong gleam of moonlight coming through my drawn curtains made me look outside. My room faced the garden and that cottage beyond. And as I looked at it, I caught sight of a light in there behind one of the windows. And I thought it was strange that that same trick of the light should be presented to me twice in the one day. But as I looked, something even stranger caught my eye. There was a man stood there in front of the front door. Now, in the dusk, I couldn't discern his features. I just got the vague impression of a tallish fellow, heavily built. And as I looked, he turned, opened the door and he vanished inside. So had my conviction been right that there was someone there, but I'd been distinctly told that the place was empty. So was my conviction right that there was someone there? I've been distinctly told that the place was empty. And if so, who was he who entered as if returning home? Well, the next evening, after the first day of the shoot, Margaret and I had dinner together again. And afterwards she got out her planchette. And it started off making loops and curves and peaks. But then her head nodded forwards as if she'd fallen asleep. And suddenly, the writing took on a definite turn. And her hand jerked to a stop at the end, and she woke up. Hello. Oh, have you been playing tricks on me? No. What does it say? Gardener. Gardener. I am the gardener. I want to come in. I can't find her here. Oh, Lord, that gardener again. I must have been thinking of the empty cottage. Empty, right. I didn't want to say to Margaret just then what I had seen, or at least what I thought I had seen. And anyway, she went up to bed. I took the opportunity to interrogate the weather. It was a cool, clear night. But as I stepped outside for a walk, I saw a tallish, heavy-set chap disappear around the corner of the house. Well, I didn't want there to be prowlers about, so I sent my dog after him, terrifying as she is. And I waited there to see if anyone might come around that corner of the house. As I waited, I heard footsteps coming from the other corner of the house, as if they'd gone all the way around the estate. Well, those footsteps came closer and closer, but no one made them. Whatever it was, this invisible presence came closer to me and then brushed past me. And horror upon horror, it felt icy cold. I reached out to try and grab hold of whatever it was, but it slipped by and went inside the house. Just at that moment, my dog came bounding around the corner as if pursuing somebody. Well, she had been, and whatever it was had gone inside the house. I could hear footsteps from within. So my dog and I, we searched the entire ground floor of the house. We went from pantry to scullery, to boot room to servants hall, and all was empty and quiet. 
Then we went into the kitchen. That was empty and quiet too, but there was a rocking chair sat by the fire and it was tipping gently back and forth as if someone lately sat upon it had suddenly stood up. Well, my dog barked something terrible at that rocking chair and I wanted to reach out and stop it, but I could not persuade myself to go anywhere near it. Now, what I had seen or what I hadn't seen gave me a rather terrible night's sleep and what the planchette had said kept repeating in my mind. I want to come in. I can't find her here. Well, someone had come in, and they made a thorough job of searching. Now, who was this mysterious, invisible gardener, and who were they searching for? Well, the next morning, Margaret had to go off down to town to make sure some particular ingredients were ordered correctly by her kitchen maid. When she came back, she had a flush of excitement all over her face. Never laugh at my planchette again. I've heard the most extraordinary story from Maud Ashfield in the village. Horrible, but so frightfully interesting. There was a gardener here some years ago, and he used to live in that little cottage. And when the family were away up in London, he and his wife used to caretake here. He married a wife much younger than himself, and gradually he became very jealous of her. And one day, in a fit of passion, he strangled her with his own hands. A little while after, someone came to the cottage and found him sobbing over her, trying to restore her. They went to the police. But before they came back, he had taken his own life. He had cut his throat. Isn't it all horrible? But surely it's rather curious that the planchette said, Gardener, I am the gardener. I want to come in. I can't find her here. You see, I knew nothing about it. I shall do the planchette again this evening. No, no, not, not tonight, Margaret. Oh, why not? You don't have to attend if you don't want to. Well, anyway, I just ask you not to. You have got something on your mind. Out with it. I believe you're nervous. You think that there is something queer about. What is it? Nothing. Nothing. Go ahead, if you must. All right, just for ten minutes. And I promise you, I won't think of gardeners. Well, no sooner had Margaret's hand touched the board of the planchette when it started writing across the page. Her head tipped forwards as if asleep once again. And the writing scrawled out there across the plain white paper. I have come in. And I still can't find her here. Are you hiding her from me? I will search the room where you are. And at that moment, an icy blast of wind blew through the place. And there was a thunderous smash at the door as if someone knocking. I turned to Margaret. Margaret, wake up. I think someone is at the door. The door swung open and a figure Ill-defined in the shadows, stepped forwards, tallish, heavy set, and as he came into the room, his head lolled upon one of his shoulders, and his eyes swept the room as if searching. They were infinitely sad, his eyes, and Margaret, whose eyes were open now as well, was staring at this dreadful visitor, and as we sat there, his mouth opened above that terrible rust-coloured beard, but no sound came out. He just slathered as he stared at us, and he lifted his head, and I could see that one side of his throat was carved open in glistening red. I don't know how long we sat there and stared at him as he stood there and stared in silence at us. It could have been mere seconds, could have been hours. But at length, the spectre turned around and walked back the way he had come. I heard the bolts drawn back from the door and it slammed shut, strong enough to shake the house. It's all over. 
God have mercy on him. On him, whatever he was, ghost or dream, memory or phantasm. Well, whatever he was, I think something truly terrible had happened in that house. And what Margaret said was true enough. God have mercy upon him. Well, Mr. Barker, I think you're going to give us all nightmares. I'm sure no one will dare go down to the kitchen garden again. Avis, you were a marvel. You were born to it. Oh, I don't know. I think a, a career on the stage might be quite precarious. Well, you tell that to Mrs. Scott Siddons or uh, Sarah Bernhardt. I've heard Lily Langtree might be treading the board soon. Now, I must be off. I've got to prepare for the weekend shoot. His lordship stands won't mend themselves. And I need to think about pumpkins. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Barker. I will see if I can find you a cake or two. <laughs> and uh, we will do this at Halloween. But you must make sure you don't frighten Mr. Scott too much. <laughs> <laughs>